that way I get a better signal upstairs. So, you're good to go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. This morning, we have the honor of hearing two of our rotating medical students present. Our first student is Taylor Fields. He's joining us from the Medical College of Georgia. He's uh, born and raised from Georgia and experiencing his time out here in Utah in the West, and he, from what I've heard, has really liked it. He will be presenting on pseudo-exfoliation pseudo syndrome and atrial fibrillation. Thank you, Julia. Okay. So. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Julia said, Taylor Fields from Medical College of Georgia. Uh, I was able to get um, involved in some research while I was here with Dr. Warosko. Um, she's currently working on pseudo-exfoliation syndrome and atrial fibrillation. So lucky enough to help. So just the purpose to start off, we really wanted to find, um, we want to explore the connections between pseudo-exfoliation syndrome um, and atrial fibrillation using the uh, University of Utah Health uh, Center Moran records linked to the Uni Utah Population Database. And we're hoping to do, um, to search the state of Utah using Medicare CMS uh, database to find a larger or broader um, patient uh, base. So the background, uh, pseudoexfoliation is one of the most, is the most common um, cause of secondary open angle glaucoma. Um, it's also a very easily identifiable cause. Um, you can see it on exam, whereas many other causes of glaucoma are idiopathic or unknown. Uh, we were able to use the ICD-9 codes, which is very specific for pseudoexfoliation, to identify the patients that we were studying. S uh, possible other associations um, are pelvic, pelvic organ prolapse and hernias, which are two um, associated conditions that Dr. Warosko is studying. And in the literature, it's been reported that it also has connections to uh, aortic aneurysms, erectile dysfunction, and coronary, come on, coronary artery ectasia. Um, so, based on the underlying common pathophysiology, um, with the help of Dr. Ravi Rajan of the cardiology department, we hypothesized that atrial fibrillation and pseudoexfoliation were, had similar uh, pathophysiology and thus could be connected. So, a little background on pseudoexfoliation is caused by a variant of the Loxyl-1 gene. Um, this is a lysyl oxidase-like uh, 1 protein. It basically, oh, it's complicated. It deaminates uh, elastin polymers to, so that they can connect with collagen in the extracellular matrix um, of tissues throughout the body. It has incomplete penetrance, so just because you have this variant, uh, which is actually an upregulated variant, you have more uh, loxyl-1 in these patients, uh, doesn't mean you'll get the disease. It's a multifactorial process. Age seems to be the uh, greatest risk factor, those that are about 52 to 64 only have 0.6 percent. Once you get over 65 is when is the typical presentation of pseudoexfoliation, and those 75 to 85 are about 5 percent in non-glaucoma patients. Glaucoma patients is obviously more. Uh, race, uh, Caucasians, it's been studied, the Scandinavians uh, actually have the highest uh, prevalence of pseudoexfoliation, somewhere around 25 percent amongst Icelanders in one study, um, above 65. Uh, and African Americans are, have some of the lowest rates. Conflicting data, so sunlight, uh, there's been studies uh, in India specifically showing that patients that live in rural communities or illiterate actually have higher rates of pseudoexfoliation and it's hypothesized that these are actually laborers outside and direct uh, higher, uh, what am I trying to, exposure to sunlight has been the cause, the root cause of this. Gender, uh, some studies show that females may be at higher risk for pseudoexfoliation, others show no connection. So all in all, pseudoexfoliation, it leads to the fibrillar material deposition in the anterior segment of the eye, which was initially where people thought it was the only place that they found it, but uh, through other studies it's been shown to be in the vasculature, muscles, and visceral organs throughout the body. So here's the common foot lamp presentation of pseudoexfoliation. You can see a clear, up in the top left, a clear central disc and then a surrounding ring of the pseudoexfoliated material. You can see the edges kind of roll, which becomes significant in cataracts, or as you get these pseudoplanes for capsulitis and you can uh, remove not the entire lens capsule. Um, and then down below you just see higher definition. So what's the big deal? So open angle glaucoma, obviously one of the highest uh, risk factors for pseudoexfoliation. 
these patients, this, this fibrillar material gets stuck in the juxtacanalicular canals adjacent to uh, the Clem's canal and basically form choke points so that aqueous fluid can't get out, increasing the pressure. You also get phacodinesis or the lens wobbles. Um, this is because the subexfoliative material actually, oh I'm sorry, it actually uh, sits at the, or it gets deposited where the zonules connect to the capsule as well as the ciliary body and make these zonules unstable which can lead to lens displacement. And that ultimately can lead to angle closure glaucoma where the lens actually uh, just forward into the pupil. And this is more common in myotic patients that are under myotic therapy. It also leads to iris rigidity just because of the fibril fibrillar material uh, deposited in the iris. Moth eaten appearance and melanin dispersion have to do with the zonules actually rubbing the back of the iris. Um, and spontaneous interzonal hemorrhages is because the vessels are deposited with this fibrous material and kind of break like twigs when you dilate them. Uh, complications during cataract extractions, that has a lot to do with the zonular instability and as well as the capsule um, kind of pseudoplanes that are formed by this material. Uh, so you can get a lot of, you can get um, lens dislocation during cataract surgery. Higher incidence of retinal vein occlusions. So a little bit about atrial fibrillation. Uh, it affects about 1% of the general population. It's a fairly common disease. It increases with age, starting at about 50, um, and then it goes up to about 8% of it, those older than 80. You can see up here. Oh, it doesn't do it. Okay. Well, at the top right, you can see a uh, normal sinus rhythm with P waves before the QRS complex, and then atrial fibrillation, no good P waves. Um, it's associated with an increased all-cause mortality and morbidity, so it is a significant disease. Complex pathophysiology, so you can see this five ring kind of uh, diagram down at the bottom right. All of these are involved in atrial fibrillation. One doesn't lead to the other, but they're all sort of, <coughs> well, it's unknown what leads to what, it's sort of chicken and egg. Uh, but of importance here is the fibrosis of the extracellular matrix is a big theme of atrial fibrillation. So current literature, Diaz et al. in 2008, they showed that Loxol-1 had, uh, had a role in biliary atresia in mice. So it actually, uh, uh, they stained it for Loxol-1. You can see in the top right, that's a mouse with biliary atresia. And it's stained brown. So you can see brown Loxol-1 uh, proteins within the uh, biliary canals. And then on the bottom right, that's a normal mouse without so much brown staining. And that's just a dull picture. So basically the importance of that study was that Loxol-1 is found outside of the body and causes pathophysiologic fibrosis. Um, Platinov et al. in 2011, they showed histologic evidence that patients with persistent atrial fibrillation have consistently more fibrotic change in the left atrial wall. So on the left, it's stained blue, the fibrotic tissue. So persistent AF shows a lot more blue, a lot more fibrotic tissue, a lot more cardiomyocyte uh, ap apoptosis with fibrotic tissue um, replacement. And then on the right, you can see normal with much less or much more uh, and, uh, controlled uh, typical displaying of the ECM. Um, so what ties this all together? Uh, in 2011, Adam et al. demonstrated that the LOX, one of the five LOX, lo lysyl oxidases, all five lysyl oxidases have the exact same basically catalytic domain. The difference is their first exon, the first part of the protein, um, actually decides where they go. LOX01 is specific to the ECM, whereas LOX is kind of throughout the body. But they demonstrated that LOX was upregulated in atrial fibrillation and contributed to the structural remodeling of cardiac tissue. And it's stained red in these pictures, and I guess it doesn't, oh, I'm sorry. I guess it doesn't really come through very well in the bottom left picture. The, the bottom pictures are atrial fibrillation, the top are sinus rhythm. Uh, you can see greater blue uh, immunofluorescence, more LOX protein. So um, this was kind of one of the big tying factors. Methods that we used. We analyzed all the Moran, Moran patients since 1996, about 225,000 individuals, identified 1,497 patients aged 65 and up. The reason we chose 65 is because that's the typical presentation of pseudoexfoliation. Anything below that would be atypical. And we didn't want to include them in the study. Uh, unexposed controls from the University of Utah healthcare hospitals and clinics were matched five to one, same age. Uh, they were matched on gender, race, and age. Uh, these individuals were then screened for the ICD-9 codes con uh, corresponding to atrial fibrillation. So what were our results? So that's actually easier to read than I thought it would be. 
the, you can see that it's stratified by age, 65, 65 to 74, 75 to 84, so on. And there's men and women, men only and women only. So I'll zoom in on this in a second. But the important thing here is that the men and women, you can see the odds, here, actually, I'll just get to that in a second. So the odds ratio of a patient with pseudoexfoliation having atrial fibrillation is about three, a little over three, and the confidence intervals were inclusive of this and did not include one. Um, so there is a greater risk, it shows, or it is presumed, um, that uh, pseudoexfoliation is, or is associated with increased risk of atrial fibrillation. I didn't show the male and female um, parts of this diagram because their confidence intervals actually or overlap quite a bit, so it's not significant. Um, there's no significant difference between the two genders in our study. So discussion, the prevalence of pseudoexfoliation was consistent with other studies of Caucasian populations. So Moran isn't under or over diagnosing pseudoexfoliation. It's completely logical that we have these numbers. And this analysis shows a positive correlation between pseudoexfoliation and atrial fibrillation, suggesting a possible genetic link, LOXL1, to the pathogenesis of these disease processes, possibly LOXL1. So in the future, we want to confirm the, this association in a larger, broader um, population uh, statewide database. Um, again, the CMS, Medicare, Medicaid databases, and the Utah uh, public database. Um, assess the presence of XFS or pseudoexfoliation contributing to higher morbidity and mortality. So it's been postulated that there is a genetic link to the pseudoexfoliation. You would get uh, atrial fibrillation earlier, and it may be more severe, so you might need uh, ablative therapy um, more often than those without pseudoexfoliation. So we want to study that. And we plan to submit this to AGS in the fall. So acknowledgments. I would like to acknowledge the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences and Moran Center for Translational Medicine, Dr. Gregory Hageman, John A. Moran, President, Professor, and Executive Director, Utah um, Public Database of, um, Patient Database, University of Utah Huntsman Cancer Center Foundation and the Huntsman Cancer Institute Cancer Center Support Grant from the National Cancer Institute. I would especially like to thank Dr. Karen Curtin um, of the Department of Medicine, HCI Pedigree and Population Researchers. You did a lot of the heavy lifting as far as the population database, database searching and uh, statistical methods. Dr. Warosko, the PI, for allowing me to jump in and come up with these great associations. And Dr. Ravi Rajan of the Department of Medicine and Cardiology uh, for really um, helping with the connection between the two. Here are my references. And thank you. Any questions? Yes, actually, Dr. Warosko has already uh, found connections between um, pelvic organ prolapse and hernias. Um, other researchers have found connections to coronary artery ectasia, uh, erectile dysfunction, um, and I'm blanking on the third. But the, yes, there are. Um, it's all. It's very recent that um, it's probably 2011 and forward that they've made these connections. Yes, sir, Dr. Stag. So, yeah, so I don't remember that it addresses the exact math. So the rate in those with pseudoexfoliation was, page me, 41 out of, so a little less than 1%, 41 out of 5, am I right about that? Um, yes, Dr. Curtin, please. Yes. So 
So, um, right, so I guess what goes into the referral, would there be significant changes? Would, I mean, is it worth, you know, what, what's the number needed to treat? I don't know. Um, it, would, it would seem logical, right? Or at least patients with pseudo-exfoliation, maybe they, and if there's a genetic link, their siblings, children, may need to seek cardiac or, or a, a maybe an EKG after the age of 50, something like that, maybe. I don't know. Dr. Patty. It's pretty, it's still rare. Thank you.